There's an old saying here that goes, all you need for happiness is a horse to fill your legs, a fighting cock to fill your pocket, and a woman to fill your arms. To mean we're only in one country. Mexico! 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 Mexico covers over 760,000 square miles of Central America and contains over a hundred million people. Its full name is the United Mexican States and it has 32 governmental regions. Most of the population live in the vast cities, including over 20 million in the capital, Mexico City. It's a country with miles of glorious coast to the east and west. It has dense tropical jungles, high arid deserts, and a rich culture and history that goes back thousands of years. On this journey, Zay Harding seeks an alternative to Mexican roads. Ian Light discovers hidden talents to attract the senoritas. And I, Justine Shapiro, learn the finer points of Mexican charity wrestling. America might have been the new world to 15th century Spanish, but Mexico had sophisticated civilizations thousands of years before they arrived. Among them, the Olmecs, the Toltecs, the Maya, the Aztecs, and the unknown people who built one of the world's greatest cities, Teotihuacan. Teotihuacan reads like one of those great mystery stories. At the height of the civilization of Teotihuacan, around 4 500 AD, over 200,000 people were living there, and it was one of the biggest, if not the biggest, city in the whole world. And then all of a sudden, it went into decline, and nobody knows why, and all the records and all the artwork were destroyed, so that today, archaeologists can only guess at the basics, their history, their culture, their society, what language did they speak, what were the main tenets of their religion. And when the Aztecs first saw Teotihuacan, they were so impressed with the place, even even though it was in ruins, that they called it Teotihuacan, which means the place that men became gods. Dramatic stuff, huh? Despite being burned and sacked in the 7th century, Teotihuacan was still used as a sacred site by the Aztecs when the Spanish arrived in the 15th century. Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent. Laloc, the god of rain. The city's influence on later cultures was huge. Many of its gods, such as the feathered serpent and the god of rain, were adopted and worshipped by the Aztecs a thousand years later. Imagine this place completely covered in bright colors. Between the disappearance of the people of Teotihuacan and the arrival of the Aztecs, a civilization developed that has only recently been uncovered, the Maya. First appearing around 1500 BC in the Yucatan region, the Maya built great cities and temples, living by a strict social structure with a bloodthirsty approach to ball games. The game ended with a human sacrifice. The two leaders are supposed to try to make a point by putting the ball through the hoop. This is the winner, holding the head of the one that lost his head, the one that didn't score. It's offering to the sun god. On this side, you can notice, the right hand is holding a knife, the blade he used to cut the head of the loser. The city of Chichen Itza is named after the mouth of the well of the Itzas. In 1923, archaeologists dredged up priceless artifacts and the remains of human sacrifices thrown into this well. The Maya were masters of astronomy and mathematics. They invented the zero centuries before the old world and lived by a calendar even more accurate than our own today. Their temples were aligned so precisely that windows and doors were used as celestial observatories. 91 steps on either side. 
which gives the total of 364 days of steps. When the Mayan Empire began to collapse around 900 AD, the jungle reclaimed many of its great cities, such as this one at Palenque. Hidden for centuries, the secrets of the Mayan beliefs and rituals are only now being uncovered. The Maya believed that the more noble you were, the more of your own blood you had to sacrifice. And they even went as far as putting pins in their tongues and their penises to get out the blood. And at one festival, they sacrificed 20,000 captives, ripping out the heart, holding it up to the sun, so the sun would rise every day and man would live. When the great Mayan leader, Lord Pakal, died, they put him in a tomb and buried him deep inside this pyramid, along with six slaves and a priceless jade mask. Then they built a little vent going into the chamber so his soul could come in and out freely and keep an eye on his people. But his soul could not protect his empire, and by 1500 AD, the Mayan cities had been largely abandoned and their people scattered across the Yucatan Peninsula. One Mayan city still inhabited when the Spanish arrived was Tulum, or Zama, the city of the dawn. In 1518, Juan Diaz described it as a city so large that Seville would not have appeared bigger or better. But by then, Zama's day was over, and a new Mexican empire was rising, that of the Aztecs. The Aztecs reigned for only a short time, but built one of the largest cities in the world, Tenochtitlan, on the site of modern-day Mexico City. At its heart was the Zocalo, the administrative and religious center of the Aztec Empire. And is this what the Zocalo is today? It's the same place, it's just like they all put the pyramids down and destroy everything. So the colonialists destroyed all these buildings and put and the church over them. Even today, hints of the original Aztec structures can be found around Mexico City's Zocalo, or Main Square. This was the actual waterway which led right to the Zocalo, which is at the corner. So the water the came straight to the Zocalo. The whole city was full of canals, right? Right. Here's the Zocalo. Um, which is the main square of the city. I mean, in a lot of ways, it's like the heart of, of, of Mexico. And before it was pyramids, and now it's all this colonial architecture. This is a serpent head piece of sculpture off of the pyramid that has been taken and placed as the cornerstone for this entire structure. This is Aztec? Yes. This is original? This is original. Wow. But the dominant architecture of today's Zocalo is Spanish, an influence that goes back to 1519 when Hernán Cortés landed on the Pacific coast near Acapulco. The Spanish invaders were known as the Conquistadores. 400 of them landed here in Mexico to conquer tens and thousands of Aztec warriors. Hernán Cortés was their leader. He was 19, but he was ruthless. And the first thing he did is order his men to burn all the ships so there was no returning home. It was either conquer or die. Aztec prophecy predicted that a blonde god would come down and appear in front of their king. So when Cortes landed, they thought that he was the Messiah from the heavens. They offered him gifts of gold and silver, and in return, the Spanish gave them torture, massacre, smallpox, and slavery. Then came the missionaries, and for 300 years, the Spanish ruled with a rod of iron.
priests, supported by the army, had an unofficial policy of convert or die. Nice church. This is the mission at San Ignacio, which was partly funded by the Queen of Spain. It had quite a high rate of conversion. But locals say that underneath there's a tunnel that leads straight to the cemetery. And if you didn't pray and get on your knees inside, that's where you'd end up. Cortez conquistadores also brought 16 horses, the first in the Americas, regarded by the Aztecs as strange deer or stags. But it didn't take long for the locals to embrace the ultimate beast of burden. Half of Mexico is cattle country, and it's home to the Jeros, which is the Mexican cowboy. <laughs> Is it quite dangerous, like learning to the horse and lasso? Yeah, yeah, it is. You can cut your fingers this, with the rope. Wow. <laughs> you, is this what happens yeah, to your finger? Yeah, yeah, with the rope. Uh, the it, thumb. It, it goes like that and takes your finger away. Really? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You didn't fight, no? I, I tried to I tried to put it back. Yeah? Yeah, yeah uh, surgeon. Yeah, right. But uh, it dies, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Many people yeah. have that problem. The women wear elaborate dresses which cost thousands of dollars. The Cheriado originated in Salamanca in Spain and was brought over by the conquistadores when they invaded Mexico. It's getting a bit serious now. I was alright until the bow tie came on, now I know I'm in deep trouble. Oh. The idea is to stay on for three minutes. Yeah. I'm ready! Mexicans have embraced and preserved some Spanish traditions even more enthusiastically than the Spaniards themselves. No, no gracias. Bullfighting isn't for everyone, and I'm not sure it's for me. This is my first time, but how could I resist? The largest bullfighting ring in the world is here in Mexico City. It holds 60,000 people, and the whole thing is really intriguing. Primitive bullfighting started 2,000 years before Christ in ancient Greece, and the sport is just as dangerous as it was when the Pope tried to ban it in the 16th century. In the last 250 years, half of the greatest matadors in the world have been killed in the ring. I wonder what's going to happen today. Is that a very good matador? Ole! Ole! What is Ole mean? Ole! That's a good one. Um, I know it's Arab. It's an Arab word. I, uh, but I don't know exactly what it means. Do you know what Ole means? Uh, no. No? No. Do you know what Ole means? I'm not sure. No? No. Nobody knows. But they say it with such feeling. Everyone's saying Olay! You don't know what you're talking about! It seems as though cheating death is a vital part of the Mexican passion for life. Divers of Acapulco risk their necks for the tourists these days, catching the swell of an incoming wave. It's an old fisherman's dare, and injuries are frequent. 
I heard that it brings out the lady. Oh, the, the ladies love a diver? Yes. They, they think we are Superman or something like that. You are yes. anyone that does that is Superman. The cliff divers dice with death for love and money, but other Mexicans risk their necks for charity and good causes. The guys, that corner, yeah. are the evil guys, so those, bad boys. Those are the bad guys. This is the good boys. The good guys. And, and you're for the... I'm with the... You're for the bad guys? Some of these wrestlers have used their popularity to become political figures and social campaigners. Best known are Super Barrio, who struggles for fair rents and decent housing, and Super Ecologista, who campaigns for environmental issues. Such passions require equally powerful religious faith. The Roman Catholic Church may have been brutally forced upon the people, but it was rapidly assimilated into Mexican life and is celebrated with fervor to this day. The Roman Catholic Church connects the spiritual life of most Mexicans, whether they be full-blooded Indian, Spanish, or the great majority, Mestizo, a mix combining Indian and Spanish blood. This is one of those rare occasions in the world where millions and millions of people gather in devotional fervor. And I, like an insane person, decided to come and check it out because until you've seen Mexicans adore the Virgin de Guadalupe, you haven't seen Mexico. And this is like the Mexican Mecca. In 1531, a Mexican Indian had a vision of the Virgin and she commanded that a church be built on this hill where he saw her. Each December, about five million Mexicans from all over the country make pilgrimage to the Basilica de Guadalupe. Indian dancers perform for days while worshippers pour into the church for round-the-clock services. Embedded in the Christian festivals lie rituals that have their origins in pre-Hispanic beliefs. Mexicans, they chase after her, they lust after her, they mock her, and they even sleep with her. Also, she's their favorite plaything and the most everlasting love. La muerte. Death. Every year on the 1st of November, Mexico celebrates the Day of the Dead. A ritual with roots oh, deep classic. in a pagan past. Ooh. Hola. Offerings are taken to cemeteries by friends and relatives of the family. Look at these, these are great. What you've got is chocolate skulls, sugar skulls. It's all sweet stuff, because apparently the spirits have got a really sweet tooth. Um, I'll have four of them, three of them, and 12 coffins. The Day of the Dead is strongly observed in Pátzcuaro, with its large Indian population. I'm on my way to the island of La Pacanda to visit the cemetery with one of the families. Hola, ¿cómo está? How are you doing? Oh, oh ah. <laughs> is, is that got my name? Look, oh no, I've got a skull with my name on already. So when does the actual celebration start today? At midnight. The souls of the dead come into the cemetery. Before midnight, people from the different islands make their way to the cemetery by boat or on foot. 
This is it. We're making our way to the cemetery now. With all the goodies. We're about half an hour late, so I hope the spirits are gonna like hang around. Wow, this is the entrance, yeah? Yeah. The Day of the Dead is one of the biggest festivals in Mexico, but it is also one of the most quiet and personal. Families sit by the graves with their ancestors all through the night, eating and praying. At the end of the night, the ghosts of the dead return to where they came from, and the living relatives go back to their homes until the same time next year. The Spanish may have come to enrich themselves with gold and silver, but the crops they brought home transformed the nature of European cuisine. There's been a market in this spot ever since the time of the Aztecs, and when the Spanish came 500 years ago, they discovered things growing here in the New World that no one had ever seen before in Europe. Basic things like the potato, tomatoes, corn, all different kinds of beans, tobacco, avocados. And walking around this market, you can feel a little bit like one of those early European explorers because there are things here that I have never seen before. Every town has at least one market or mercado. This is La Merced in Mexico City. I knew when I came to Mexico that I would see the chili, but I never expected to see such a variety. Mexicans can't live without chilies, and they know which ones will make your eyes water and your mouth feel like it's on fire. Ask before you bite. How many chilies are there? Quantos variedades? No, hay como 150 variedades de chile. 150 different kinds of chilies. Mexican ingredients have influenced food the world over. Where would Italian food be without tomatoes, peppers, or maize? Beans, too, were discovered as a staple in the Aztec diet. And chocolate was a luxury drink consumed by Aztec King Montezuma to enhance his libido. There are conflicting stories about the introduction of the domestic chicken to America, but Mexicans love their eggs for breakfast. The Spanish also brought crops that remain vital to the Mexican economy and culture, including rice, olives, citrus fruits, cheese, beef, and coffee. Gorditas. 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 These are gorditas. They're made of corn. They've got beans, salad, melted cheese, and they're lovely. This one hasn't got chili on. <laughs> that one has. Ooh, that is chili. Oh, I love them. <laughs> of course, not all popular Mexican delicacies hit it off with the Europeans. Native Mexicans didn't eat much meat, but they loved their insects. Are those beetles? Si, sí, humiles. Humiles? Si, sí, humiles. For eating? Si. Sí. Así? Así solo. Oh, it's really crunchy. Rico. It's good. It's sí. rico. It's, it's, it's good for the health, buena para la salud. Sí. Sí. Tiene proteína. Protein, protein. Y este, ah. anemia. For anemia. ¿Gusta probarlo? Sure, I'd love to try one. Keep an open mind, Justine. Keep an open mind. Keep an open mind. Okay, one, two, three. Oh, there you go. You know what? I'm going to close my eyes. And you put it in my mouth, okay? Okay. Ready? One. Two, three. <laughs> oh. oh, it's like, it's like chemicals. Oh. I just ate a beetle. I just can't believe I ate a beetle. Perhaps more enjoyable is Mexico's multi-purpose flatbread, the tortilla. Right, Mexican food can be a little bit confusing, so I've got me here to take me through it, but this is what I do know, like, tortilla, yeah? 
This is the basis of all Mexican food. You get it like that. If you chuck lots of stuff in it, fold it over, then it becomes this, which is uh, enchilada. And if you roll it again really delicately like that and fry it, it becomes a taco, yeah? Mm -hmm. And then if you tuck the ends in when no one's watching, it becomes a burrito like that. Uh-huh, and also but you can cut it up and you can fry it and it's called chilequiles. Right. It's spicy, it's like a morning breakfast. Right. Or you can have this for a quesadilla. Quesadilla? It's a tortilla and you fold it with cheese and avocado yeah. and all wow. that stuff. And there's also this too. They use this for to make fayudas and they put beans and cheese and they stick it on the comal. But that's just like it's a Mexican pizza. A beach frisbee, no? <laughs> there you go. Oi! <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about that, it's just... Can I have that back? So out of order. So just remember, it's not a toy. It's something to eat, yeah? Mexico's contributions to drinking, tequila, and its near cousin, mezcal, both have their origins in cactus-like blue agave plants of the Mexican desert and mile upon mile of arid Mexican farmland are dedicated to the production of hard liquor. And just to prove its high octane, mezcal often contains a preserved blue agave worm in the bottle. Mmm, mmm, mmm. How you say it? Lick, lick your hand. Lick your hand. Yeah, salt. Salt. Put Sprinkle the salt. Lick the salt. Uh -huh. Then you... You take a, a lemon mm -hmm. and squeeze in your mouth mm -hmm. all. Mm. Take your caballito, mm -hmm. cheers, and in just one shot, mm -hmm. drink mm -hmm. all the mm -hmm. tequila. You drink good tequila, yeah. you don't have hangover, headache, delight, no, no, it's beautiful, the tequila. There are over 500 brands of tequila, but make sure you avoid the cheap stuff. Look at me, I think I need a hospital, and this is it, hospital paracudos, which means hospital for hangovers. Welcome to the cure, this is it, this is beef stomach, or you can get goat stomach. This is fish tripe. And this is uh, fried cactus. And of course you've got about four or five different chilies you can put on them as well. Mexican artistry also encompasses traditional Spanish crafts such as guitar making, glass blowing, the Moorish influenced Talavera tiles famous throughout the world. and pottery, which blends Spanish and native Mexican styles. There's some really nice stuff to buy here. You wrap it up in newspaper, put it inside, maybe in the jacket or something, put it in your rucksack. When you get home, it's in a thousand pieces. Mexico is a trinket shopper's paradise. Prices are low, there are markets everywhere, and the ingenuity of Mexican artisans is legendary. Since the days of Hernán Cortés's conquistadores, people have come to Mexico for its precious metals. One of the country's most famous sources of silver is Tasco. Mexico has its Zocalo, where people gather, socialize, where they celebrate national holidays, fiestas. And this weekend, I'm lucky enough to be here for the annual Silver Fair, shopping.
Tosco Saturday Market is the best place to find great deals. This is just a silver paradise. There's everything here. Earrings, necklaces, bracelets, baby rattles, barrettes, little silver boxes, funky things, conservative things, ethnic-y things, ravings, religious things, tacky things, things with stones, things with written things on them. If you want silver, <laughs> come to Tosco. And if you can't find what you want, have it made. Okay, I think I found the place. I, I want earrings. I did this. E earrings, yes. Mm -hmm. And I can't find them anywhere. Okay. And I have a drawing of, of what I want, and they said that you can make this. It's just it's simple. It's just a heart with. Con alas. Alas. Sí. Wings. Yes. Okay. It's, is it true, verdad? You can make. Sí. Usted puede hacerla. Claro. How much is it? Fifteen dollars. Fifteen dollars. Fifteen dollars. Sí. To make earrings. Sí. Por su salud. Increíble. To make the, these earrings, it only costs fifteen dollars. Custom design. Sí. Increíble. Perfecto. <laughs> sí. I would like okay. that. Decorative metalworking is part of the ancient traditions of Mexico and Spain. Cortez claimed silver mining rights to Tosco, 100 miles south of Mexico City, and Tosco silver became famous across Europe. Tosco remained a mining center on and off from then on. But it wasn't until the 1930s that an American businessman called William Spratling encouraged the artisanal talents of Tosco citizens and gave the city its reputation for making silver jewelry. It's beautiful. They're perfect. And they're so light, so delicate. Qué bueno. Sí. Que le gustara. Sí. And they're much prettier in silver than they are on paper. Seven hour drive from Acapulco, you cross into the state of Oaxaca. Puerto Escondido is one of the top ten surfing locations in the world. And every year in November, they hold international surfing championships. I saw you out there, I thought you looked good, man. Oh, I want to see you doing your little work. My racing days are over. Is this a good competition for people to come to? Yeah, it really is. The, the wave here is, is a real quality wave, and uh, it's got some real power. Uh, tube riding is what you want to do, and that's the right. nice thing about this place. It has power, and it throws consistent tubes, which a lot of beaches don't do. Right. Tube riding is the maximum art of surfing. The Caribbean coast has a different atmosphere, where colorful fishing boats ply their trade, and the vibe is, well, perhaps a little more relaxed, though, of course, you could exercise yourself with a little scuba diving on the second longest barrier reef in the world. The Mayans must have loved the sea, too. Tulum has both history and perfect white sand. It's not the Hilton, I'll tell you that. Oh, sand. Arena. The best part of this whole room is the carpet. My little sandy carpet. Little traveler's tip. Create a little mosquito death poison barrier. On the other side of the country, you can escape north to the beautiful Baja Peninsula. Here it's possible to experience the sea life close up, either kayaking or taking a licensed boat to see the whales gathering in the Laguna San Ignacio. Oh, it's rocking the boat. It's pushing it. I think it's underneath at the moment. Certain whales are known as friendlies, seeking out human contact. 
Despite being 50 foot long and weighing up to 40 tons, they always seem to know exactly how gentle to be. I think I need to change my trousers. Mexico has mountain ranges running throughout its length, and one of its most dramatic geological features is the remote Copper Canyon. Reached via the romantic Chihuahua Pacific Railroad, the Copper Canyon is part of the Sierra Madre Occidental mountain range. The Copper Canyon is one of the last great wilderness areas in the Americas. Four times the size of the Grand Canyon and one and a half times as deep, dropping to 10,000 feet from the surrounding plateau. For centuries, this has been the home of the Tarahumara Indians, and as Zay Harding discovered, you need their help and their permission to explore their canyon. This is Jesus, a local guide who knows these hills better than anyone on Earth. Along with Skip, we're going to take a hiking trip deep into an unexplored canyon. The Copper Canyon can't be hiked alone. You need burros, which are a type of donkey, and most importantly, Tarahumaran guides, the only people who know the canyons and the trails that get you into and out of them. Skip, why are we carrying live chickens with us? It's easier to carry live chickens than dead chickens in a refrigerator. So they don't keep well out here? No, not in this heat. And you get the choice tonight if you're going to kill it or clean it. At the end of the first day, we've descended some way into the canyon, and it's time to make camp. Cakes that I make. That's good. I began to wish I'd offered to clean the chicken rather than kill it. Just twist its neck. Uh, I'm not quite sure how to do that. Why don't you show me? Mr. Skipper, Captain Skipper. Deeper into the jungle at Palenque and Yachtilan, it's possible to step back over a thousand years into pre-Hispanic Mexico. The Lancandon Indians are the direct descendants of the Maya from Palenque. That's why they call themselves the Hatchwinnick, which means the true people. They live on the riverbanks, deep inside the jungle, and nobody came in contact with them until 50 years ago. And as I'm meant to be staying there, I just hope that I can find them. Lancandon are the most isolated tribe of the indigenous people in Mexico. They wear tunics of white cloth, which were once woven from tree bark found in the jungle. This is a local village of La Janja. Of course, when you get to a village like this, you've got to look for the head man, which is Vincente. Is it okay from... See? I've just been invited to an ancient Mayan Bokshe ceremony. These are friends of the family. And the Bolche 
is this stuff, which is an alcoholic drink. And it's actually fermented from the Bolche tree. <laughs> That's strong. Who? I just you you look up into which yeah you you take a thing work and now we had a drink and cigar. Some time in the evening to tell stories. This is a old mine fable that's been passed down for generations and generations. And they can go on all night. They were when Nabi were with me when Nabi and Juk. Well, I've been invited to go further down the river to meet the rest of the family. We're meeting them at sacred ruins of Yachilan. And I need the guys because apparently it's hidden deep inside the jungle. The ruins lie on the Usu Macinta River, which separates Mexico and Guatemala. Yachtilam is an extremely important and powerful Mayan city. This is the temple of worship. There are only 700 Lankandon left in the jungle, and some still practice the old Mayan religion. For centuries they have been making a pilgrimage to the temple to worship and pay respect to their ancestors, who built one of the oldest civilizations in the world. There's an old Mexican saying that goes, people here don't really say goodbye. And it's even the same with the Maya, because they built these incredible temples so they'd last for all eternity, because they believed that somehow, one day, they'd return. And that's how it is here. Save your air miles, because once you've been to Mexico, you will want to come back. <laughs> Thank you.